Hello everybody, daddy's home, welcome back to the Agostino Zinger show, episode number 173, with me, your host Agostino Zinger, how you doing, how you feeling, huh, hope you guys are well, rested, hydrated, all that malarkey, I'm gonna grab my coffee over here, um, yeah, hope you guys are well, how are you guys doing, huh, it's Thursday, for you guys out there that love the weekend, um, you got one more day to endure until it's Friday, and then you can finally get fucked up, um, hang out with your friends, scratch your balls or your vagina, watch Netflix or not, go on your phone or sleep, hook up with somebody or cry that you don't have anyone. Whatever you want to do this weekend, you can do it because we're only one day away for you bloody weekend losers. There's nothing I hate more than people that look forward to the weekend because I don't look forward. Oh, my hat fell there. I think that might have been karma there. <laughs> um, I don't look forward to anything. Little King of Kings there, you know, little, little old school to Prem hat there. Um, I don't look forward to anything, man. I don't look forward to anything. I'm I'm, I'm a non look forward to her. All right, I just stay right here where I am. Right, I put my feet in the ground. Right, I point my toes forward and I just stand right like a man does right i don't look forward i don't look back i just stand where i am that whole looking forward to things is fucking gay in the nicest sense of the word man in the nicest sense of the word ever bloody hell don't get how people can look forward to stuff i'm looking forward to the weekend looking forward to a couple of days like doesn't that, why what sense does that make nothing you end up wasting it anyway doing jack shit or doing the same shit or you know what's interesting, right? The people that like the weekend or that love the weekend are the ones that hang out with their friends in a bar after work. And guess what they talk about? Work! If you're going to go and enjoy your weekend, right, and have a good time and hang out with your friends, why not just disconnect completely and not talk about work at all? Why don't you try that? And I, and I bet you, I bet you have a much better time. But the interesting thing about it is, have you ever tried to... Um, if you've been with a group of friends, have you ever tried to steer the conversation away from work and see how people reacted? No one gives a shit. You try and talk about something else, like, hey guys, um, anyway, so has anyone bought anything nice recently? And it's like, oh, I can't buy anything because my, my job ain't paid me in time. It's like, oh, here we go, back again with a work conversation. Here we go, back again. It's like, come on, guys, man, let's relax. That's why um, I've always found it rather difficult to hang out with work colleagues in general. I think the only place where I was a bit more social i was a little more i was a little more social than i had have a have been in the past was maybe the place i was at two places before where i'm at now right well yeah um i was a lot more social there um but that was generally because you know i was i kind of lucked out in that regard i kind of went i kind of joined the company and i joined a team that was fairly chill loads of good personalities other people i kind of got on with boys or girls so it kind of made it easy. It, it didn't feel like a work hangout. It felt like just like, you know, colleagues hanging out and chatting shit. But um, yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know. So something I've always kind of think, I, I don't know. The whole looking forward to weekend thing, especially when you're doing that sort of stuff is a bit dumb for me. Um, Again, I can't really speak that much about it, I guess, in some sense, because my weekends are usually um filled up with uh, staying at home, watching YouTube videos, recording podcasts, making a mix. I don't know, um, DJing or going out and raving, right? So they're not I'm not necessarily changing the world either on my side, but bloody hell, man. Looking for the weekend only to hang out with your friends that you work, you hang out at, at work so you can talk about work stuff. It's just, I, I, I want to shoot myself in the face continually. Um, but again, that's just me, all right? That's just me. But um, apart from that, yeah, I'm feeling good. I just came out from the gym as per usual, a little, little, little workout during the week. Low, 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 low. Today, I just concentrated on doing loads of um, strength workout. So, I did back squat. I did overhead press. I did bench press. I did about five sets of each. Um, kind of, you know, ascending weights. And, yeah, it's tending to get a bit stronger, get a bit stabler. Um, my squat is getting a whole lot better than it was previously. Um, I'm trying to, you know, I'm doing it for reps, especially with heavy weight. is a, is a lot more difficult than doing it for what, one, rep max, one rep max, of course. But... I have a little bit of a weird sense of my level of strength because when I used to do back squats in CrossFit, I tended to usually do um, one rep, one rep max, right? Where you kind of, you know, you put you put more weight on the on the bar, do one rep, you rest, you put more weight in the bar until you hit your kind of ceiling. That's what we tend to do at CrossFit. But now in the gym, I tend to do like five sets. I tend to do five sets of five, and which is a lot harder to do, of course. So you tend to, I tend to start at a lower weight and then slowly but surely creep it up like 
2.5 kg, 5 kg until I kind of hit my max. And today was a good day. But um, yeah, feeling quite good, feeling quite fine. Don't feel sore at all. Um, I think it's been helped that the last couple of weeks I've lost quite a bit of weight in terms of fat. So I think it's making things a lot more easier, which is, you know, which is not really um, a big revelation. But I've kind of felt that when I'm running now, I kind of feel like I can run faster for longer um, while maintaining the same sort of pace. So that's been very, very beneficial to the stuff that I've been doing now. And when it comes to strength, I don't feel as if when I, I don't feel as if when I do something as heavy as I did today, I don't feel as beat up as I would do previously because it took quite a lot out of me. But now I kind of feel quite fine. I feel quite stable. I feel like I can go again if I need to go again. But, you know, I'm going to go for a run again tomorrow. But yeah, feeling fresh, feeling good and feeling ready to start podcasting, right? Podcasting. Podcast. Weird word, weird, weird word to say, isn't it? Podcasting. Anyway, let's jump on into it because, you know, time is of the essence and podcasting calls. So, number one topic to talk about here is, oh, so um, to go on to talk about um, Nina Kravitz to talk about yesterday, uh, like I mentioned to you previously, I saw Nina Kravitz play at the... Um, Wolverstone Assembly as part of the festival called Retection, which is presented by the Crank Brothers. Crank Brothers, if you don't know, are like a, the, you know, the seminal sort of like, you know, mainstay uh, London promoters. They put on some of the most interesting parties over the years. They sort of started off just doing, you know, the kind of parties I used to do, where you just put a party on in a bar or a pub, and then you kind of like slowly work their way up. And they've got to a point now, they're kind of doing it full time, and they're putting on these lows, and they're putting on um, club nights all over the, all over the land. They're, you know, hiring in a bespoke um, sound equipment, lighting. They're really, really up in the levels of production. And now they've even gone a step further by introducing the idea of having festivals, right? Um, Electronic-based festivals. Because I think, for the most part, I think, as I read, um, there's a really good Guardian review of the Retexture Festival that's online too that I recommend you check out. I'll actually link it in the show notes. Um, I think, as I've mentioned a few times, uh, no, as I mentioned, but as you probably guys would know, London is probably you know, or the UK is home of the festivals, right? We uh, we 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 know how to do festivals from from hippie festivals to indie festivals to metal festivals to bands to hip hop to art, whatever you want. Maybe not R and B, but I mean, that, that might be a good one. Isn't it? Like, would people go to the R and B festival? They probably would, wouldn't they? Yeah, um, to punk, whatever it may be. We have all the festivals unlocked, but the one thing we don't really have at the moment just yet is what they have in continental Europe in terms of the electronic festival. We don't really suss that one out just yet. We have stuff like Field Day um, that kind of have a good electronic programming uh, in their festival, but for the most part, it hasn't really been a thing. But in the last few years, we're seeing a lot more festivals pop up since the you know the Giles Peterson festival is coming up. You got this stuff from Retextured. You got the festival. I think the Jazz Cafe are doing. You've got something. I forgot. Was it Funica or someone's doing? There's a few coming up anyway. Lots of people are doing festivals, um, electronic-based festivals anyway, for the most part. Let me see if I can focus this camera a little bit more. There you go. Is it focused? Yeah, there. Um, so a lot of people are doing um, these kind of electronic festivals. And they've, again, I've not been a fan of them because personally, I'm not really a fan of hearing DJs play in an open air environment. I don't know. Maybe because I haven't grown up in Berlin where that's the kind of norm. Um, during the summer, there's lots of open uh, open air uh, parties that you can go to, rock up with just your beer and just, you know, pay an entry free and hang out and see good DJs play. But, you know, Berlin is a whole different kind of beast because, you know, for the most part, they have, you know, um, umpteen amounts of years of experience and know-how from doing those kind of things. They also have a local council that's more forgiving for them playing loud music out loud in public. So they don't have the limiters that we have for most festivals where the sound isn't really that great because they're not allowed to crank it up as much as they want to. Blah, 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 blah. But the other thing that Berlin does have that we're kind of copying is the idea of these festivals taking part in different sort of venues all across um, the city. So that's what we're doing here. And I remember there used to be a kind of festival. We used to have a festival here in the UK too. I forgot the name of it that I went to. It was called sort of like an indie festival where they had it based in loads of different um, little venues. Like they had it in Shackwell Alarms, Alibi when it was open, um, Old Blue Laughs. I forgot the name of it. But anyway, so they're kind of copying that kind of um, remit where you have these events happening in different club in different clubs or spaces across London, but they're all tied underneath this one umbrella. And for this, it's retextured. And it was an audio-visual experience, you know, really, really rich experience. You felt immersed in it, completely pitch black for the most part, um, loads of strobing lights all over the place. A real, real treat to be involved in, I've got to be honest, to be there. It was really, really amazing. And I think I mentioned yesterday, I found it quite hard to find any videos online of people that are there. 
but luckily now um i kind of stumbled upon this girl on social who kind of posted up a video clip of um what happened and i'm not sure if she's um if she was actually the person that was in charge of doing the lighting or the uh, the creative direction of the festival of, of the performance of Nina kravitz but it looks fucking awesome so i'm going to play a little bit of it for you now and for you guys watching visually you can kind of see what i was talking about and why i thought it was so fucking amazing but um let me see if i can get this up here now da, 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 da. let's put this up back there but yeah it's again i'm still thinking about it a lot now because it was really good good experience man it's so cool to have again i think it was super it's a super rare experience anyway right to be in wolverstone and see someone like nina kravitz play is fucking insane and then on top of that for it to be in a wolverstone assembly hall which is you know a, a freakishly amazing or beautiful space i've learned to utilize it in that way for a club night was just really good man they had everything organized really well. like i said yesterday the security was probably a little bit too overbearing um they were literally everywhere like they flooded the entire arena like if it wasn't people picking up cups or somebody standing in the toilet it was somebody standing in a smoking area or somebody walking around the, the dance floor they were everywhere but what i liked about it was that organization wise it was so on point like you scan in get your ticket you get searched you walk in bar to the left bar to the right downstairs is a toilet downstairs uh, at the back is a cloakroom with 65 million people behind the desk giving you tickets and and putting your finger up in a thing it was great fucking great i love the whole thing and i and i'm and again um like i mentioned before the video i saw a lot of people recording which kind of pissed me off because you know most people weren't dancing they were recording but as the night progressed everyone kind of put their phones down and actually got to the business and there's a video here from this young lady called uh, uh, uh what's her name called hannah marshall i'm sure she was part of the creative direction yeah because she says on a twitter profile that she's a creative director and visual artist so i'll show you a bit of the video of why i thought it was so good and we can kind of go from there what it is let me get this screen and make this bigger du, 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 du. but yeah I'm, I'm hoping we get we, we we have more of these things happening because you know with 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 um you know i i, I rant and rave on here a lot about how draconian the london licensing laws are for the most part of the uk licensing laws for the most part so clubs are really suffering in that respect and you know if clubs suffer we suffer right in terms of uh club goers and people that are in love with electronic music so if there can be a little bit of a middle if there can be a bit of a compromise being made and we can you know maybe invest more time in going to these sort of electronic festivals that are based in different venues that maybe don't go on that late but or that maybe aren't as frequent as a club night would be but you still get a chance to see some of your favorite djs play in some really interesting spaces i'm all for it i'm all for it because unfortunately i can't I, I, and unless it's like mixed garage which is probably one of my favorite venues out at the moment and even maybe uh mixed garage maybe fun maybe fun no, no maybe xoyo and corsica studios if it's not those kind of places i can't really or me or fold for instance i can't really um i can't really go anywhere and have faith that the night's gonna be good i can't really just go on a friday and just have faith it's gonna be a great night i don't know who's gonna play i don't know how long it's gonna be i don't know how much the front ticket's gonna be like Christopher studios being a good example like it's always 20 quid and plus do you know what i mean which is a, a lot of money especially if you're going to to bricks sorry to elephant and castle you know you're probably gonna get a, a, you probably know you want to probably get an uber back home which is another 25 or 30 quid so if if we can't do that then i'm gonna i'm more than happy to give my money to these kind of promoters to put on these um electronic festivals uh during i don't know during the year whenever they can in different venues i think it's interesting again maybe the problem is you know because there was another dj playing as well on a friday i went to see but i couldn't because it clashed with nina kravitz which you know was annoying but i guess you kind of had to plan those things out but anyway let me play the video so you guys can see what i was talking about um let me get up on here hopefully you can see that so yeah so this is a video from hannah marshall um if you're listening on podcast it's um, a lady called hannah underscore marshall and it's uh, her tweet of um retextures whole thread of what happened so i'll play a little bit of it for you now let's go to the start but why's the sound not there no sound interesting is it here no sound there either that's weird isn't it let me go back here again let's hide this Maybe it's me. Bu, 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 bu. Hmm. I have no idea why that sound isn't playing. My aux display video capture. Hmm. Where is it? Let me see if I can get this loaded up. I'm not sure why it's not playing actually. It should be playing anyway. 
do, do, do. see if that works. Does that work? Let's get that on there. Let's start and see if that works. Hmm, still nothing. Still nothing. Is that a new sound? Did you hear that? Probably not. I don't think so. Hmm. I have no idea what's going on there and why we can't hear the sound. There's something happening here. A bit of a. Oh, there, it, it is. There, there is. Um, there is something not. I'm, I'm seeing on here. There is a little bit of a problem, maybe, with the actual display of it. What's happening in there then? Built-in microphone default. It should be ISO. The, the, I got device. Let's go back on here. It should be that, right? Cool. Bish bash bosh. Why is it not playing? Hmm. I have no idea. Is that playing now? You can hear that, right? Yeah, it sounds like you can hear that. Cool. Let's get this up on the screen then. And load this show. I don't know why it's not playing for me. That's annoying, but hey. What can you do? So yeah, so this is the this is one video. So this is from like the back of the room, as if you, as you can guys can see maybe from the for the video. So that's the back of the room, completely blacked out for the most part, right? So you can't really you know uh, see much apart from just bare bodies, right? A bit of a smoke machine, some nice lights on there on the side, and then this is a video of kind of like um, Nina Kravis in front of the big massive projection screen, which is awesome. Loads of nice little cool graphics on there. No real light on top of Nina Kravitz herself. Like again, you just saw her silhouette. Um, what uh, what do you call it? Um, floating in front of the screen, doing her kind of uh, trademark dance that she always does. And then here she is again. She is again. the queen again. DJ laying down. You know, strobe. I didn't I, I didn't notice that strobe in front. Okay, also no wonder you get that effect. There's kind of strobe things in front. Doing bar LED things. There's another awesome video some of someone dancing, going crazy. That is awesome, really. That's really cool. Silhouette because his dreads flowing or something. Really. I mean, I'm swinging around in the air. Again, more strobe effects. Like, just, again, pr amazing production. I'm sure, like I said before, I'm sure this sort of stuff, these are the kind of things that, as a promoter, would are going to cost you a lot more, right, to make the show um, better. And they're probably not going to, you're probably not going to see any benefit from it monetarily, right? But in just terms of a pure aesthetic taste, and for one to put on a cool event, you want to, you're gonna to want to do it because this, this is the stuff that people remember. This is kind of, this is the, also the kind of stuff that people are gonna share online, right, on socials and stuff. So if anything, it's a great way to market and to kind of really get your brand out there and to kind of separate yourself from the crowd overall. Because this level of production, I haven't seen it in a while from a London club night, mate. Now, I won't even call it a club night. It's not even fair to even call it that. It was definitely an audio visual experience. But yeah, and then here's a bit of a visual saying, do do um, do you think behind her as well? Just an amazing thing, man. Also, I just love the idea that. You couldn't actually see her at all throughout the whole entire performance. You could just see a silhouette of her the whole time. So it just really, it really kind of switched your brain to kind of just get into the party mode and just dance, which is fucking cool. Again, loads of strobe effects, people going crazy, loads of dancers, all the ravers coming out. And again, um, uh, yeah, so this is um, Nina Kravitz name one of the top five performances. Da, 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 da. Yeah, so follow Hannah Marshall if you want to check out more of the, more of the videos. But yeah, that's what I thought. And that's why I thought it was one of the, again, one of my favorite, favorite experiences that I've had in Clubland in a long, long, long time. And I, I definitely, 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 definitely can say that. Um, so, yeah, that was that. Let's get the screen a bit smaller and move on to the next subject. What else is on here? Joker movie trailer. Ooh, have you guys seen this, right? The Joker movie trailer looks fucking awesome, right? It looks cool as fuck. Um, let me see if I can get up on here. So, Joker movie trailer. We saw, I think we saw an image or a couple pictures of um, Joaquin, Joaquin Phoenix, right? Um, starring in this um, movie a while ago. Um, I don't think anyone actually um, knew what was going on or the details of the thing. Does it help I know to have for someone to talk to? Myself, oh, let me stop that. I think it's playing in the background. For, I, I know for myself, being a podcast fan, listen to The Fire and the Kid, I know that Brian Callen has got a little bit of a cameo in it. So, we, we got a bit of info from him. But then he had to stop talking because I think some people from the team actually listened to the podcast and told him to shut the fuck up. But DLs, so... They kept it fairly hush-hush for the most part. We don't really know what the deal is, but all we do know is that it's based on the Joker's early years, right? The kind of Joker inception, the kind of Joker origin story. Then it kind of concentrates on him as a person, um, as a human being, and what kind of drove him um, to be the Joker that we know and love now, right? One of the, you know, One of the best sort of, like... Uh, villains out there in superhero universe 
and from the looks of this um, trailer that's online now um that i'm, I'm sure everyone's watched because it's already got like a million it's got a million so you got 11 million views and um it looks like they're definitely i don't know if i got i got a bit of taxi driver um fit um vibes from this right like um loads of really cool ephemeral shots of new york him wandering around um just kind of um a really beautiful window into psychosis that's what you got from american tech i mean taxi driver right this kind of i this kind of um, um portal into what would ease what would drive somebody to become psychotic um quite quickly over 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 like a, a brief period of days and i think we're gonna see this happen um with the joker a trailer so i'm gonna play a bit of it in the background now just the, the visuals of it um so i don't get dragged off youtube hopefully th this will work um but yeah so this is online now you can see it um via most places that you see trailers from it looks incredibly interesting um i'm sure they're going to do something really cool with the release um i'm sure it's going to be really popular with most um comic book fans and i know from sure cause some comic book fans are super 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 what's it called um they're a bit picky in it with the films if it doesn't really live, live up to the expectations they kind of you know for a bit of a hissy fit but i think this might get a bit of goodwill because again it's like a based on it's based on the joker's early years it's not something that feels like it's gonna be trying to you know go over old ground or try and paint um, Dracula phoenix in the same light jared leto i just think it's just his way of doing things differently and again i just want jack walking phoenix is one of my favorite that, um, actors ever so it's going to be awesome to see him in this movie. Um, he looks like he's lost a bunch of weight for this role too. It looks incredible. It looks incredible, incredible, incredible. Um, trying to get that really like weird, psychotic, like wafer thin look to him. And again, it just looks incredible. It looks really cool. Um, I'm a bit dubious about trailers because trailers always sell things differently than uh, the actual movie comes out. So it might end up being a bit shit, right? In general, but I'm hoping not. And you know, with Joaquin Phoenix, it's hardly going to be a rubbish performance because he's a really good actor. So it's going to be, it's definitely going to be interesting to watch, in my opinion. Um, again, it looks interesting. It looks cool. Loads of really cool, interesting shots. Again, um, I, I can't wait to see when he kind of finally realizes his full potential and gains full power and what he ends up doing. Uh, but again, um, the Joker movie soon to come out. When when is it due to come out here? In theaters, October fourth. So still, still a while to go. Jesus, see how gone he got wow Look how much weight he lost man that's incredible like how actors commit to this sort of level of performance always baffles me man how they're able to do that like look at that he he looks like i don't know how much weight did he lose for this you think like that's insane you can literally see his rib cage i've never seen him that skinny um yeah wow amazing 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 i'll leave it there for now but yeah october 4th the joker is coming out oh, do, 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 do. what else is next oh um let's talk about peggy goo so um peggy 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 goo i've um it's been interesting to see the reaction of peggy goo um oh the reaction of the public to peggy goo these last couple these last few years or so right um it really kind of shows you the fickle nature of fandom on social media and specifically in electronic music, right? Um, I think for the most part, electronic music has been immune or maybe for the most part, I think it's been immune to what's been happening in like, you know, the general public or in most forms of popular general, more popular music for the most part, right? Um, in terms of plants, right? Industry plants, in terms of people getting undue praise, in terms of, um, accusations of plagiarism and electronic music is kind of um skidded under the surface those things still happen don't get me wrong but it hasn't been to the extent that you see in the pop world or in hip-hop world even right um but i think the uh arrival of peggy goo and maybe in some cases the um, the risk the kind of you know the would you say nastier maybe nastier kind of suffers from the same thing too but I think there's been a, maybe a, a Amelie Lenz and Charlotte the Wit. There's a few of these girls that have come have come up and have kind of, have kind of got a lot of criticism from the electronic music fan base, right? And also some of their peers. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that some of these girls, especially the ones that are at the top, are uh, get it, it seems like from the outside are getting all the love and all the praise, right? All the adulation is kind of getting heaped towards them. And then the girls underneath that kind of bracket are kind of feeling like they're being left behind, right? Or feel as if like 
they are not getting as much praise as they should do, even though in their head they think they're technically uh, better than the people that are getting the praise. And what what this kind of brought to mind was this quote that I've always thought about since um, Jordan Peterson mentioned it, right? Because he kind of uh, painted it in a really macabre and in a really sinister and a really dark way. But in my head, it's always seemed quite. It's always seemed kind of air. It's always seemed. It's not sorry. It's always. Um, it's always kind of uh, stood out to me to seem kind of lofty and, you know, airy-fairy. But when Jordan Peterson spoke about it, he gave it a really sinister edge, which I've never really thought about. And I'm going to read it out to you guys for now. Um, and it's a Bible verse from, um, again, me no Christian. I don't go to church. I don't give a flying fuck. But I think um, this scripture kind of is just something interesting just to think about as just, you know, mainly as just words, right? So this is a scripture. Um, it's from Matthew 13:12. And it says the following. I'm going to get it up on the screen and zoom here. It says the following. The verse. The, from, the new, new, from the New International Version, it says, whoever, wh- whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even, ha- even, if, even what they have will be taken from them. New Living Testament. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. And then one last one, English Standard Version says, For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. So, if you summarize those three um, quotes, right, these three right here, I think it kind of really accurately describes the problem that people have with Peggy Goo and other people that are in that kind of, um, uh, are down on that sort of level. It feels as if the ones that are at the top get all the opportunities and the ones that are just below don't get any, right? It, that's what it feels like if you're that person or if you're a fan of somebody that's a tier below those kind of girls. And for me, it's been interesting with Peggy Goo because it felt as if like in the beginning, she got quite a lot of goodwill. It felt as if like when she came in, she was this hot um, Korean girl that lives in Berlin um, or that's from Berlin. I, I'm not too sure. Um, uh, she DJs really well. She makes great tracks. Um, she plays vinyl. There was loads of things that she has a great sense of style. People really kind of felt she was a great, she was a bit, a bit of a fresh, breath of fresh air in the scene, right? She clearly was loving it, um, being behind the decks, right? And then came, and then came her relationship with Jack Master, who's like, you know, the quintessential uh, party dude who's always having a good time. And they just, you know, if if anyone kind of, if there was any DJs out there who represented what it, who kind of, um, if any DJs, if there was any DJs out there who seemed like they were having a time of their lives and who other fans felt as if like they could live vicariously through them it'll be jack master and peggy goo right two top class djs two people operating at the top end of the spear and two people that kind of generally people felt were really good then it seemed as if like you know the peggy goo machine went into overdrive right she was literally everywhere 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 on top of that, she's always, always on social media, always kind of posting, uploading videos. She's a child of the social media age for, for, for the most part. She's native to the app. She knows how to use it to her advantage and she's consistently getting her app self out there. Um, she, the, um, she's saying yes to basically every um, streaming uh, DJ set request, which again is giving her more of an audience. It seems like because nowadays, if you're not on those kind of, you know, boiler rooms or those other kind of uh, platforms, they kind of they kind of act as if they kind of act like um the DJ's version of a comedy special for the most part, right? It's like an opportunity for you to kind of get yourself out there. You might not get paid for it, but it's a good way to brand yourself and market yourself. You only have to look at someone like a Jada G, for instance, right? She did set a deck mental, and I'm sure that really kind of catapulted her up to the stratosphere. I'm sure some people knew who she was, but that 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 set really kind of um, gave her a whole new remit to kind of explore new audience probably expose her to new festivals blah 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 mostly john basombo is a good example too he's he's um um some uh seminal uh set at deck mantle was the one that really kind of catapulted him so she seemed like she was really kind of hustling and going for it but then when you know her work aside you know her own social media her her kind of willingness to go anywhere and everywhere and play wherever she wherever um the check called then came the press side of it, right? And they were kind of well happy to kind of have her on top of their page on your banner, right? Like, because there's no denying that she does look quite photo friendly. She is quite photogenic. She wears interesting cool colors. You know, there's just something about putting an Asian girl with a German accent that wears cool colors on the front on the front of your um, web page that's gonna you know drive. That's hopefully gonna drive some traffic. 
So the press were on it, right? They were willing to kind of just like, you know, slap loads of labels on her and big her up and give her all, all the single press that she needed to get given. And I think for the most part, that is probably where the issue came from. I don't think the issue came from the fans. I think fans still love her. I think if you're a Pega Goo fan, you're always going to look out for her releases. You're always going to look out for her stuff. You're going to watch, want to see her play. I'm happy to see that whenever I see, whenever I see Pega Goo play nowadays, I think in the beginning, it was there was a lot of dudes hanging around the booth. Now, whenever I see her play now, I see loads of girls. I see loads of girls like that are big fans of her. I look up to her, and I think that's fucking awesome. I think um, for the most part, I'm not the I'm not really fond of the whole idea of like, ah, oh, let's get um, let's make our festival lineup fifty percent women just for the sake of it, right? I think women should be given spots on a lineup based on merit, just as much as other men that aren't noticed. Because it's weird that kind of argument that we're having now in DJ land or electronic festival land, right? Where a lot of women feel as if they're not being represented well in these festivals or these club nights. It's the same old people again and again. But even on the guy's side, I think there's guys out there that would, that, that would agree with the women that, you know, some there's some local dudes who are residents in, you know, local bars and clubs who feel as if like, they're not getting their chance, their spot to play at Fabric because it's the same old people playing again and again. And they don't get an opportunity, let alone women. So it seems as if, like, you know, women are maybe give, are, are being given preferential treatment and being popped in front of the queue when there are other people who don't get any shine whatsoever who aren't playing because you know for the most part <coughs> i think guys know especially i know if you're like an underground dj or something that isn't well known the only way you have to, the only way you can play and get yourself out there is to put on your own club night but putting your own club night is effectively you hiring the space for you to play right and then hoping that you can break even which is a big big risk right all the time just to just for you to play in front of people as hoping they can book you so anyway, that happens. Blah 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 blah. And now, um, her late her latest song came out, right? A song of hers came out, and it felt as if the the tide was shifting. I felt it online. I'm sure some of you guys felt it too. It felt as if like finally, it not finally. It felt as if like people were now starting to hate Peggy Who, which again is interesting because she doesn't really she not doesn't strike me as a really as somebody that you can hate on that easily. She seems quite you know easygoing. Seems fairly cool. Doesn't really talk that much. There's a few interviews here and there, but she fairly keeps she bare, she mostly keeps herself to herself, and um, it all kind of stemmed from this track that dropped right her new track. Um, what's the track called? Starry Night, and um, this is the article there on Resident Advisor. And I think as soon as it dropped on Resident Advisor, it was on every single electronic music uh, publication that you can name. It was everywhere, it, literally everywhere, right? Like they were covering everywhere. Everyone was trying to use like you know some kind of clever pun to tie in with the track title uh but resident advisor got in there first and they said uh, peggy goo starts her own label goody records with her new moment M moment ep and again this is something that separates her from maybe some of the other um top djs now that are around that everyone's kind of uh bigging up is that she makes tracks she makes she produces her own music and it's really good it's of a high quality um and she says the following I relish what I, I relish I wanted to be my I realized I wanted to be my own boss with my own music said Gu about establishing an imprint uh, Peggy Gu is kicking off her own label Gudu Records with a new EP of her own Moment is out on April 19th we'll have two new tracks from the South Korean born Berlin based artist uh, called Starry Night they love that innit? they're going to put that in there there's a little added Wee! she's a flame she's hot out here um anyway um and han pan as her ra recommended once ep for ninja turtle last year goo layers her own vocals in korean and english over the tracks which again i think is going to separate her from her peers going forward you know she if she evolves the way i'm hoping that she does as a dj it'll be great to see what she how she what she develops into as a live act i think there's a lot of room for her to grow that way and for her to be a really interesting spin on what live acts is right and not just be what most people do and just have you know live instruments it could be something a bit more with vocals it could be some visuals there there could be maybe some choreography <coughs> maybe some <coughs> performance art pieces i'm really interested to see how she kind of does it um her evolution that way blah blah, blah. last August go tease um imprint in an id in an interview id explained that the name comes comes from the korean word for shoes and that it's also a play on gudu in her words peggy gu does um I realized I wanted to be my own boss. At first, I wanted to have just my music, but now I think people would like to know what kind of artists I support, which is cool. So she's going to have her own thing. So anyway, um, this is great, right? Awesome for her. Congratulations doing her own thing. But the coverage of it was insane. Then people on social media started getting annoyed. Like, you know, why is she getting all the tracks? La, 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 la. Then at the back of it, that kind of really sparked the kind of outrage was this event on uh, on Resident Advisor, which kind of explained why Resident Advisor was first to announce 
um, her thingy majiggy, um, her label imprint. So she did this event with um, Resident Advisor tied in with Nike. I don't know why, what the point of it was. No, I do know the point of it. It was um, to tie in with the release of the Nike 720, right? I'm pretty sure. Nike 720s. So it's called Lift London, right? Um, and it was a, a, a Resident Advisor a, a connected event. Um, as this profile page says, it says here, we profile three prom promising DJs following their appearance at Lyft London Party Nike. You can also listen back to their sets. Um, on Thursday, 21st of March, we threw a party at the venue at the MO uh, venue, MOT Unit London, Unit 18 in London, which is a really nice space, actually, in collaboration with Nike that featured Peggy Go alongside three of the UK's most exciting young DJs, all women. Uh, DJs were Danielle, Fuazia, and Mogan, while listening to recordings of their Lyft sets. Um, so again, this is a great thing. I think it's cool, right? I'm, I'm happy to see more women get more opportunities, more chances in that respect. I think highlighting this is a good idea. I think I like to see, I like seeing what disco women or those kind of people are, are doing or this woman. I like that kind of imprint of it better because, you know, you just, you have an agency that specifically caters towards, you know, uh, female, non-binary, uh, gender neutral, uh, individuals, right? Or queer individual, whatever it may be. And then you kind of become the home of that kind of talent so if people want to hire uh, really forward-thinking edgy djs that happen to be female they go to you as opposed to wear fabric let's just have half the half the djs come from this label it doesn't really seem sincere it doesn't seem that it's done by merit uh, but again i don't know if you're a girl if you care by merit you probably just want to be in that space because you think you're good enough right you don't really care about giving you get the opportunity of merit. You're just saying, look, I've had enough. It's the same fucking people, seven people playing all the time. Lee Burrows. Uh, Jeremy, it's the same sort of seven names. Can I have opportunity as well to play? I get it. Maybe it's that regard. But again, anyway, this this tied in with the, the appearance of this um article was, or this event tied into, you know, the back of the Nike event. Um, the DJs played. For the most part, it seemed like an interesting set. Everyone had a good time, blah, blah, blah. Okay, cool. And then for some some reason, I don't know how this happened, um, the news got leaked um, that supposedly um, she got paid like $40,000 or something that, to do this party, right? To do this event, like, you know, the whole thing, the Nike event, the, the DJing thing. And then people really got their, you know, their kind of panties in a twist about this whole issue. Like, how the fuck did this happen? Like, how did she get all this money? Um, and I guess for me personally, I don't necessarily have a problem with it. I think um, I think she's a good enough DJ to probably command that kind of level of money nowadays. Is her praise or is her hype maybe unwarranted? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I think we just live in an era now where people do get propped up or do get um, shot up into the stars probably a lot sooner than they probably should just based on the fact that you're promoting yourself on social media. Social media is generally a shortcut to fame, a shortcut to no notoriety, right? Because you have the power to share, market, promote, advertise, whatever you make to millions of people, but just from the just from your smartphone in your pocket. So I, I completely understand that. But I also get the thing that maybe, just maybe, there isn't any kind of sense of parity, right? I don't know how old Peggy is, but if she's, She's only been DJing for, let's say, what? Maybe 10 plus years, something like that. It's not as much as other people have been DJing in the scene. And she's already earning, I don't know, three times more than what they've been earning in their careers. I completely understand why they'd feel a little bit annoyed by it, right? And here's, and I think here's a bit of the set. Let me play a little bit of the lift set here from London. Let's get a bit of it now on the, on the screen. I can understand why they'd be annoyed by it. Right? I, I, I get it. I get it completely. And again, this is an a slight observation you know the whole dj thing of like um when a famous dj is playing and there's a complete there's a real need to like want to be next to them and you know be in the shot i've never been that guy um i think the one time we did it when we went out and saw we went i think it was in innovation night in um or uh, we went to wait, what's that place called oval space in bethnal green right and we went to go see Dixon and Arm play, and then we we somehow managed to get to behind the booth, right? Took a picture of them, and they were fucking cool as fuck. And we left, and we went out, right? We just took a picture and we, and we ducked out. They were really cool people. Um, and again, I wouldn't do it again. Like I think um, we just got lucky that day. I think Dixon was just drunk, and or the other people were drunk, or they didn't really know what was going on. And they, we we kind of got a picture of those two legends. Um, that was cool, right? Um, but I wouldn't do that again, especially not now, especially not at this kind of event. It just comes across a little bit beg friendly. Um, again, just my opinion. I don't know. She's not my friend. I don't know her. I think if she was my friend, that'll be a bit different. And she, hey, I seen her come through. But even then, I can't, I quite enjoy. I'm, I'm one of the rare people that 
even if I got a little guest list to go see Drake perform live at a concert somewhere, I'd want to see it from the front of the stage. Like, you know, maybe just see it wearing a photo. I'd want to stand maybe where the photographer's pit is. So I don't, so I'm not getting squashed by everyone. That's a little, a little privilege you might get. But I wouldn't want to stand to the side of the stage, right? That's just not, I'm not really seeing the performance. That's not really what I want to see. I want to see what the crowd sees, but up close. Um, so I never really got the whole standing to the side of the DJ and like shocking out, like as if like, you know, it's it's like your night. I don't know. I don't really get that personally. In my, again, in my opinion only. But this is a little video from the, the actual event. Looks It looks fairly cool. Everyone's having fun. Raven shocking out. She's obviously smashing it, doing her thing, head to toe in Nike. But yeah, people weren't happy with this, right? They weren't happy at all with the fact that she was getting paid so much money by Nike um, to promote, you know, this shoe that no one really cares about in the scene, I guess, for the most part. But I guess for me, um, uh, what is there? Is there a little? Let me see if I can find a little uh, interview. No, so yeah, so I guess the interesting part for me in this regard um, is that I just think having this, having read the Jeff Mills interviews, which I think you should check out. It's on Resident Advisor now. Go check it out. It's Art of DJ and Resident Advisor. It's probably one of the best interviews I've read in a long time. Um, having reread that interview three or four times, I think there is a problem. There is an issue with you know the scene maybe propelling people up to star them a lot sooner than they probably should have and then it may be fizzling out for them and I, I can remember from the top of my head it may be happening to Seth Troxler right he got kind of shot to space and then he kind of fizzled out but then came back again just for his own strength too he kind of decided to kind of take a break he kind of got off the drugs got off the drinking for a bit I seem to remember and now he seems like he's, a, he's in a far better place than he was previously um and I see what the scene can do to people, right? It can overhype you. It can maybe make you think you're a lot better than what you are, right? Because of just, you know, just from the pure number of festivals and club nights that you do, which is probably how most DJs kind of equate how far they're going in their career. I'm sure I'm sure there's some DJs out there that are obsessed about how many listings they have listed on their resident advisor page. I'm sure that happens. But I think for the most part, the good thing about this current era, even with the Peggy Green included, I know it can be annoying for some girls out there. I think there, because there is something that no one is talking about. This idea that it does seem weird that some of the biggest DJs out there that are getting promoted or that are getting put on most of the big club nights or most of the big festivals happen to be girls and they happen to be really attractive. There is something going on in the scene where they are propelling these really attractive DJ, these really attractive DJ girls, um, to you know heady heights of stardom. And I have a. And I have a slight feeling that there are some girls out there who aren't as photogenic as some of these other ladies who are equally as te- or equally as good technically or maybe better who aren't getting the same opportunities that they are get that they, they should be getting, which is a, again another issue because you know what it does, what, it, what it goes to show is that as bad and as closed off and as um, uh, patriarchy laden and as misogynistic as the male-dominated electronic DJ scene can be, what's being shown now is that the same thing will just happen in the in the female space. It's not going to be democratic, right? Um, Peggy Goo isn't um, where she is now purely based on her DJing ability. We we must understand that, right? It is, but it is kind of based on her marketability too, right? And how she looks. Um, or the people that she knows, right? These are things that we are seeing echoed in the DJ world um, on the men's side. And it's also happening on the women's side. So we're seeing that these issues are going to be reflected either way. What needs to happen, I think, and what this woman's doing and what other people are doing um, and what um, what's, the point? What's, what's the thing I like to go to in Mixed Garage? Oh, I forgot the name now. But anyway, what other parties in London do is that they try and promote their friends uh, their peers who are as good as they think as the other people that play at these big club nights. And the whole idea is that I'm going to keep promoting you in the hope that the one party that I do put on this book or this agent is going to be there and they're going to then think, oh, you're sick and want to put you somewhere else. But what I'm not going to do is get the bait person that always plays at all the places, get them playing at my alternative event just for the name alone and then have anyone just come for that and not listen to my friends. I want my friends to be the one, the main core interest. And if your friends all happen to be girls, then no worries, do your thing. But I just don't like the idea of like forcing this idea of like, oh, let's just have parity 50-50 because it's not going to be achievable, right? Because it's, you know, by law of maths or numbers, there, there definitely isn't as much female DJs out there as male DJs. There definitely isn't. I just know that off, off the top of my head, I can just, I, I'll just assume there isn't. And if there isn't, they're probably not going to be as good as males just in terms of pure numbers. But I do agree that when I go to a night out, I want to see my DJ reflected. I want to see the crowd reflected in the DJs I go see, right? That's the beauty of what happens when you go to Berlin for the most part. It's very interesting programming because, you know, if you go to Greece Müller, 
depending on the night that you go to, some events don't even promote who's playing on the night, right? You don't even know who's fucking playing on the night. But what you do see is you see people that you see the well, whoever you're around on the on the dance floor with is somehow reflected on on the DJ booth, right? They look like you, right? So it's it's a mix of people. And I think sometimes, especially in European club line, especially in the UK for the most part, we don't necessarily get that too often. It's usually a little bit of a disconnect, right? So if I'm going to a nightclub and there's lots of girls around, there should be maybe a few girls playing on the lineup. It's just, you know, it should, should be like a, a even as a, as a fucking token, just get one or two on there for fuck's sake, right? Um, but again, I just think the beauty of nowadays, like I went before, is that we have social media, the internet. So regardless of what you think of how much praise Pegu is getting, what you can do is just promote yourself. You can put yourself out there. You can become your own publicist, marketer, agent, manager, and you can finally get the voice, the, the vision out for yourself to the public, right? You could essentially stream your sets from your mobile phone, just playing at home. I'm thinking about doing that myself. You can um, record your sets and upload them onto SoundCloud. You can promote your events on Facebook with your Facebook ads. You can post flyers on Instagram. You can really, really get yourself out there. It might, now, it might, it's not going to be. It might not be the same level as getting a check from um, Nike for forty thousand dollars from, um, from as Pay Good did. But eventually, you'll get to the level that you want to get to. And I think, for the most part, for most DJs, I think for myself anyway, and I'm, you know, and I'm on the low, I'm on the lowest, 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 lowest of the rungs. But for most DJs out there, I think what we all want is just the ability to be able to play regularly and have that sustain our lifestyle. We want to pay our rent, um, go on holiday, buy nice things through the skill that we've learned of DJing. That's all we want to do, right? So I think, as much as it would be great if all of us could have nike billboards and adverts i think we have to be honest and just say you know not all of us are going to get that because not all of us are blessed with the looks that some of these other DJs have or the marketability or the person or the personality or the charisma or the charm or the on-camera appeal i think we don't have some of us not just don't have that i know i have that it's fucking space but no joke some of us don't have that so if you don't have that then there are other avenues for you to get then make some money right there i'm sure there's people out there who play in various bars and clubs around the country who charge a decent amount and they make bank, right? They make absolute bank, right? They make bank, they're able to sustain themselves, they work maybe part-time, and they live pretty good lives. And I think for the most part, the fact that you can do that is beautiful. And I know for some some reason, you know, the festival thing is getting annoying, but I think there are more club there are more clubs and bars opening up, you know, in some areas, not in London. Uh, there's more alternative festivals popping up, especially here in London. There's all opportunities for everyone that's gonna it's gonna always come around. But I just don't think throwing stones at somebody like Peggy Goo um, because she's getting all the opportunities is fair because I think as we've seen in the male dominated uh, DJ industry it's the same thing right I'm sure the top 10 male DJs get paid three to four, five times more than the ones just outside the top 10 it's always been that way right um, and I'm thinking and I'm you're seeing the same thing happen in the female space especially when they're photo friendly especially when they dress well especially when they've got they got good they speak well like those opportunities are only, always going to come their way you can't really deny that um but what is healthy for the scene is that the people underneath the top 10 the people in, in tier b tier c are able to sustain a career that's that's the strength of a good scene it's not that we have a class djs getting getting paid millions of bucks to go play for people in ibifa the what makes a good scene is the fact that b and c even d can um you know have a healthy lifestyle can sustain themselves can pay for things just through djing alone that's where the strength of our scene comes from so i think i, I get it the peggy you thing is annoying i get it the media overdrive her promoter is annoying but i don't think it's her fault you know the the the, the publications out there love to talk about her i guess because she generates clicks generates engagement I don't think it's her fault. I don't think it's fair to throw stones at her. And again, I'm interested to see how she evolves over time. There might have been, there is a feeling in me that's like maybe she got pushed forward a bit too early, but I think she's been, she's done great so far. She just got thrown in the deep end and just kind of carried on swimming. I'm interested to see how she evolves and develops over the years. And I'm sure she's going to be a mainstay in the industry. But I just think in general, I think it's our responsibility as a scene of rule, right? To kind of, you know, support her during this kind of journey. I don't think it's fair to kind of throw stones at her, especially the other female DJs throwing stones. I just think that I don't think that's constructive at all because she plays a role as does the other DJs. They all, we all play a role in kind of just maintaining where the scene goes and the kind of dictating where it kind of evolves to the future. That's kind of my rant on the one Peggy Goo. Um, next, Spinny Bitch Collective. Oh, man. This made me sad. It made me sad. It made me sad. It just made me laugh. It made me laugh, I think, for the most part. So, 
I saw this on Diet Prada, you know, those fucking cunts, but it just got me thinking, right, about, just in general, about women, right? Women love to get, um, there, there is something very, I don't know, maybe, maybe guys too, maybe, you know, guys do have that too, I'm not talking about, it. there is a certain man, yeah, I'm just, I just thought about CrossFit or the other thing, there is a certain type of person out there, right, that gets hoodwinked by the latest fitness, health and fitness fad out there consistently, right? It's as if like it's a sport to them. It's as if like um it's a hobby. They just can't help. They just can't help. They just can't help getting twanged by um some kind of new health and fitness regime. And it's always some wacky thing. It's never anything standard, right? And for the most part, we all know what works, right? Sleeping well, drinking loads of water, avoiding sugar, avoiding carbohydrates, processed food, eating healthy, vegetables, working out five times a day. We know what works, right? The, the usual some strength training but there's all these fads that pop up everywhere like cat yoga goat yoga all this sort of shit blah 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 blah, blah. and this one thing popped into my fucking timeline because of um diet product that i had no idea about um and it's called the skinny bitch collective right so this dude supposedly is promoting this idea of women wanting to be like you know look like um wafer thin um runway models i'm assuming this is the idea behind it and um, it's called the Skinny Bitch Collective, which, you know, again, um, is fairly, um, the name probably says more than it needs to be. This is an article, well, this is a post I found on Diet Prada. And it says that the following, um, you know, Diet Prada being um, the, their snarky selves, the caption goes as following. Um, happy International Women's Day. Uh, Russell Bateman, at Russell, whatever his name is, I think he's deleted his account from last time I checked. Um, the white male mastermind, again, why would they say that? Like, why, why does it matter? What <laughs> He's a dude uh um what do you call it teaching women fitness classes like does that give it does that matter really um i don't know the white male mastermind behind the invite only fitness collective sbc also known skinny bitch collective uh took a gang of seemingly cloned ponytailed white women on a retreat to kenya oh that's why you mentioned white okay so they went to kenya to go do fitness and everyone's getting annoyed among the sisterhood fostering activities like hot hair balloon rides chef prepared organic meals that chia peri jam um, dancing around the tree of life. They also managed to use the local Messiah people not only as backdrops, but as literal props in their face. That is quite nuts, though. They had them just standing behind them. When they're doing oh, I love social media so much. So, again, I'm not for the whole PC culture thing or being too woke, but I just think you just have to use some common sense. Some common sense when you do these things. People are just too sensitive now. They just can't have these you know, Maasai warriors in the background just standing there whilst these girls do fucking planks. It's like, ah, anyway, this is funny. So anyway, it continues. Um, but as literal props, some videos have already been deleted, but screenshots appear to show girls rivering around uh, to locals like an obstacle course. <laughs> Skip it in and out. <laughs> and our Maasai warriors really tall as well, Kenyans, right? So what, do they have to like jump over them and <laughs> shit? <laughs> Booty twisting on Maasai, on Maasai cloth. Chick deserves special attention. Really classy. It's 2019 and apparently people still haven't learned that POS, people of colour, ethnic groups don't exist as in embellished, already privileged lives. The colonial mindset is alive and well, I guess. That was tied into like, do you remember that? Did, did I show you guys that, that picture? Um, let me see if I can get it up. Uh, there was a Vogue Brazil. Uh, let me see if I can get it up. Let me hide this. There was a Vogue Brazil editor, right? And she went, um, Vogue Brazil editor. There we go, right? Do you remember? Did I show you guys this, this image? It's how purple it's still online. She didn't delete it, right? Please don't say she deleted it. So, yeah, there was a Vogue, there was this uh, um, edit, a star director for Vogue Brazil uh, tweeted this thing. Like, this is fucking insane, right? This was a good idea. But this is his image, right? And gets to tweet up. Um, it says the following. Uh, Vogue Brazil style director uh, Donata Mireles Mireles had a very disgusting the 50th birthday party theme last year. There appears to be a Brazilian slave and master theme. Uh, Muchamas Mukamas half slave house slave sorry who were re who were very clearly darker complexion were posed as props alongside guests. Jesus Christ! Imagine this being a fucking. I would just be so uncomfortable. This be my birthday. The lady's got legs for days, though. As an old lady, she's got her, she's got some pins on her, mate. She definitely does a bit of yoga. But imagine that. So, if you're listening to the podcast, there's a lady sitting on a chair, 
white lady and these two black women um, standing beside her in these kind of you know um white robes and then you know she has other guests sit on a chair and take pictures too it's just fucking like and this all comes from this sort of era of, of you know of um slave trade where you know the black women will be outside um or outstanding at, um around the white guests fanning them and making sure that they're comfortable it's just like how did they how did she think this was this was appropriate again she stepped down you know the internet kind of you know went ham on her and and took her out the paint but this is like you know this is probably a level a bit worse than the skinny bitch collective i think for the most part skinny bitch collective is just you know just some dude out there um trying to get his rocks off by fit working out these girls in kenya but yeah you gotta do better man you have to do better let's see if this video is and again i just i just think that, that there is obviously girls out there that want to do these sort of things it just makes me wonder girls or just people in general there is a type, type of person that just thinks these things are applicable right that would pay money to go to a retreat in kenya to work out it's just like insane to me <gasps> watch a bit of the video here there you go they're working now back to the kenyans doing planks twisting and turning left and right cool do your thing next video here is them walking around literally in between the Maasai warriors in kenya this is insane brother like literally like an obstacle course hope they got paid a lot of money to do this <laughs> So it seemed like there was a real kind of urge to kind of go towards the whole you know um voluptuous curvy model or maybe we're kind of going back or back again uh to girls wanting to be skinny and this is passing around the tree of life having fun i guess for the most part which is fucking area where just a random tree they found eating food oh, on the outside of Ksenia, the can you pass oh my god they went to africa jesus christ ellie door God damn it. I'm sure this guy deleted his, his Instagram, didn't he, right? He's not on Instagram anymore, is he? No, he's not. Wow. All right, man. All fucking right. But yeah, again, I don't know how people get duped to this sort of stuff. I've never really been a fan of these, um, uh, what do you call it, trendy, um, situational kind of gym activities that are mostly based on trend and not that sustainable i'm i'm a real sucker for the idea of just like doing um the the, the standard things running working out going to the gym eating healthily um or eating healthy and you know intermittent fasting that malarkey all the other stuff you can kind of miss me with that but again i don't know what some of these white people kind of get involved in and what they think is a good idea but for me i don't get it but hey it's not for me what can i do uh next on the list here quickly let's talk about supreme because they're the best you heard about the the collaboration they're gonna do with john paul Gutier. that sounds fucking crazy right it sounds interesting very left field collab i'm really interested to see what that looks like a lot more interesting than the stuff that we've seen from them maybe of late um but they just released um this their new tease and again i think there's a couple brands out there. Sorry for the bogey noise there. There's a couple brands out there that do still do great um, streetwear tees. I think um, Supreme obviously being one of them. And the other that I kind of pull out of my bag is uh, uh, Pleasures, right? They do some really great tees too. But Supreme just announced their spring summer tees. Which is, haven't they been doing this lately? Or is this a thing they do before? Is this something they do all the time? Where they kind of release their spring summer tees? Yeah, because they usually have a collection of tees they put um on their preview, right? Before the collection drops. And then they have another bunch of t-shirts they put out as well. This is kind of tiring, tying in with the collaborations they do, right? For the most part, you don't see collaborations, especially trainer collaborations. They come out later during the year. And outerwear, Stone Island, North Face, those are things that they kind of announce later. But um, they've done an uh, announcement for the clothes. Let me actually put that as full screen. But but yeah, so the the t-shirts are coming out now. They look fucking cool. I think as per usual, I think you're not you're not gonna there's no surprises there in terms of seeing cool t-shirts from Supreme. Let's get it up and make this full screen here. Da, 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 da. And again, like loads of things that I generally wear. I think for the most part I've, I've kind of stayed off wearing Supreme just because, you know, I think um I think for the most if I'm being completely honest, I think the the fans have probably ruined it for me now. 
Um, you know, I've been wearing Supreme for maybe, you know, close to a decade, if not more than a decade. So I've kind of seen all the kind of ups and downs of the brand, but it kind of feels like to me nowadays with the abundance of kids that are wearing it, it just probably, there's just too many children wearing it now um, who are kind of infatuating the brand and it kind of, kind of, you know, makes it a little bit, a little bit corny, a little bit shitty for me to wear. But I still think for the most part, if I was, if I cared enough to go to the shop or to, buy a bot i definitely wear a lot of their outwear pieces like their leather jackets they make their pea coats their trench no sorry um the the trench coat their pea coat the the chester field that they make the long coat they've made they make that season season out um the, they've got the they've got that jack that that trucker jacket actually the fuzzy one with the orange that was one of my favorite pieces they made in a long time um some of the track suits i'd easily get too because again I, I put supreme track suits in the same category as pattern track suits i think they make some of the best track suits out there especially considering some of the shit stuff that nike put out so i'm a big fan of what they do just that sometimes it can be hard to wear it based on the fans but anyway the t-shirts look really cool loads of really great t-shirts here i'm releasing very soon my favorites probably being this at the front here um who the fuck is supreme this looks really awesome i like that no uh -uh. um Another great tea here. Uh, another one. That's a, a Salvador Dali. Um, right? Salvador Dali print. Yeah. Awesome. Um, the the Pieces of Memory. That looks really cool. I don't know. It's, it's not Salvador Dali collaboration, but it looks... It's, I think it's taken from Salvador Dali's painting. Um, again, the Who Felt Supreme is one of my favorites there. This T-shirt this t -shirt with the keyboard is awesome. I really... Again, just a little cool piece. I'm not sure what it's based on. If it's based on a movie inspiration. But again, just like a really clever design. Like a, a keyboard, right? Just on the front of a t-shirt. It just looks fucking awesome. I fucking love it. Um, again, uh, what's this? Is the t-shirt based on? Who's this based on? Molotov Kid. Original artwork by Andy Howe. Okay, awesome. Another Andy Howe t-shirt there. Uh, Ghost Rider tee, which is great. Which again, is probably tied in with the, the Ghost Rider um, leather jacket and trousers that came out. Which I'm sure some people got. If you have the money and you could able to get it, like you should have got that thing. That was probably one of my favorite pieces. So 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 cool. And looks just looks different to complete anything you might have seen before. Uh, I love the riders, the horses. That's awesome. They they have quite a lot of t-shirts with horses on it. Isn't it? I think um, I think James Jebby or the design team at Supreme do have an infatuation with them. The kind of the wet, the American Western era, right? Um, in general. Again, Cupid, which is based on, I think they've got that actually. It's an actual um, accessory, right? One of the miscellaneous items that they put out again this year. That looks great. Uh, Por favor, Supreme or, or for, the, for the people. Okay, nice. French tie in there. Maybe that's to do with. I'm well, surprised no one's done um, uh, Gillette Juan tea, actually. Uh, Gillette Juan, you know, the yellow vest protest happening in France. I'm surprised no one's kind of twisted that and made that into a t shirt. But again, a great lineup of t shirts, all out very, very soon, I'm assuming. Those are great tees there that I would definitely wear. I think out of the, out of them, maybe let's say maybe like one, two, three, uh, four, five, five t-shirts out of everything. That's a good number for me, man. To completely honest. And again, they don't look overly supremey t-shirts that you can kind of wear with most things. Again, it sounds dumb to say it, but you know what I mean. Um, and they're all gonna come out when April six. So they're coming out today. Uh, yeah, they come out today on on the fourth. Yeah, so April fourth. So today, if you're around, check out Supreme's new T collection. They're there and ready for you to go with. Um, what else I want to talk about? Anything else I've got here that was on my mind? Let me see what's on hype piece quickly before I duck out here and leave you guys. Um, I think that might be it. You know, yeah, I think that might be it for now. I think I'm gonna put some more stuff on the list for tomorrow because obviously I missed of some stuff here. But yeah, let's um. Let's leave it there. This is the Agostino Zinger Show episode number 172, I'm sure. It's 173. I'm not sure one of them anyway. Um, thanks so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have you as my company. As per usual, if you want any information regarding what I do in terms of DJing, uh, blog entries, in terms of stuff that I read, I, I always upload the books that I'm reading on my blog and stuff like that. If you want to check that out, if you want to contact me and ask me a question, Go to my website, it's agostinozinga.com, agostinozinga.com. You can find the link below in the show note description of your podcast app, or you can find it below on the video. Um, again, I'm DJing this Saturday at the Heathcote and Star, if you want to see me play. I'm going to be at the Drake concert tomorrow on Friday, so if you're around and you see me, say hey. And if you're watching on YouTube and all that malarkey, like, subscribe, leave a comment, let me know what you think. And until then, I will see you guys again tomorrow for another episode of the show. Uh, take care. Um, look after those that love you. Um, say you, say I love you to a couple of your friends too. Let them know how much they mean to you. And I'll see you guys again tomorrow for another episode of the show. Peace out.